So unit two is biology. So we'll be looking at all life science. The first half of the unit has to do with cells. Okay, which, just like in chemistry, atoms being the unit of all matter, okay, we're going to be looking at cells, which are the unit of all life, the basic unit of all life. Um, so, if I am looking at what kinds of things might make something to be considered a living thing, what kind of characteristics would it have to show? Carbon. Uh, oxygen. Okay, so some kind of like respiration yeah. or metabolism. Okay. Can reproduce. Can grow in some air Okay. Uh, produce waste. Produce waste. Yeah. Now, I would say. Some of them. Adapt is, is not always necessarily for one organism, but it might be for a species over time. But yeah. Okay. All right. So if we're just looking at like the first four here, because like you said, adaptation is not really for a single organism, but could be more for an entire species. It's still still valid. Okay. But if I'm looking at something and trying to say, is that a living thing? Okay. It has metabolism, which means it like consumes energy and oxygen. It reproduces, okay? it grows, and it can produce waste. Well, by those four things, fire is alive. Okay? If I'm just looking at those four things, fire is alive. Fire consumes energy and, and oxygen. It, re it reproduces. A spark can start another fire. Okay? It can grow. Okay, fires get bigger, they just consume more energy, okay, and they definitely produce waste. They produce carbon dioxide, water vapor, so, okay, those are their waste products. But fire is not alive, fire is a chemical reaction. So all living things have to have something else. So, exactly, okay, for something to be considered a living thing, it must contain cells. Now, that does, however, bring into controversy one type of organism. We use the term organism very loosely when we apply it to this, though. You might get vaccinated for these sometimes. Not bacteria. Bacteria have cells. Viruses. Okay. Viruses are not cellular organisms. Okay. Viruses are what we call obligate intracellular parasites. Okay. A virus is little more than a shell made of protein and some genetic material inside. Okay? All a virus can do is attach to a cell and inject its DNA into the cell. The DNA will go into the nucleus of the cell where it will hijack the cell. And it will tell the cell to start making viruses instead of what, instead of what the cell needs. Okay? So this little piece of DNA will go into the, into the nucleus. It will write itself into the cell's DNA and the cell doesn't know any different. And instead of making whatever the cell is supposed to make, like insulin or something like that, it now starts making viruses until it fills up and pops. Okay? That's how a virus works. Okay? That's why, if you've ever had this sensation, like you went to bed and you had like a little tickle in your throat, and you woke up in the morning and you felt like you were going to die, okay? You, you got a virus, okay? Some sort of cold virus or something like that, rhinovirus, okay? That would reproduce very quickly. Okay? You think about it. One virus infects one cell. That cell can make several hundred viruses. And it can do that in a matter of like an hour to two hours. Okay? Now, every virus that comes out of that cell, and there's a hundred of them, can go out and infect another cell. Let's say only even half of them are successful. That's another 50 cells hijacked that are each producing a hundred new viruses. See how quickly it can reproduce? That okay? can be a problem, right? You can get sick pretty fast. Right? And the real issue is, how does, your, how does your immune system find these things? They're really, really small. And they're attached to your cells. Okay? Once they're attached, it's too late. The DNA already goes in. So the only way for your body to get rid of them is to kill its own cells. Okay? So it's like, um, you're infected. You've got to die. Okay? Like that's the way your immune system works. It sees your own cells, they're infected, like, well, for the good of, you got to take one for the team, okay? For the good of the rest of the body, 
this toxic T cell is going to kill you now. Okay? It is like a walking dead. Yeah. Okay. I don't care whether that person was my, my brother or my son or whatever. It, they're a walker now and they're going to eat me and then I'll turn into one. So I got killed. Okay? And that's all right. Right? I mean, you, you see that. That's kind of the, the drama always in those kind of shows is that, oh, I got to kill this thing that used to be somebody I knew. Well, in your body's immune system, it's, uh, I know that cell belongs to me and it used to do some good stuff for me, but it's going to kill me if I don't kill it. So I have to. Okay? That's why you get so weak. Okay? You get so weak when you're sick with a virus because your cell, your, your body is destroying itself in order to get better. Okay? Yeah. Is that why older people stay longer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Selfie. Yeah. Can like viruses infect other types of types of cells? Usually, yes. Okay. Some viruses are kind of random, they'll affect anything, but both cells will affect. Most viruses will affect certain types of cells. Is that why older people stay sick longer? Because they're getting new cells. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's why. Okay, so that's why guys like um, my my father-in-law is, is in the nursing home. We go to visit him fairly often, and uh, we have to make sure that we get our flu shots. Like, and we were never people who got flu shots before. And I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Okay, um, but um, I never got flu shots because the one time I got one, I got really sick and I swore off I'd never get another one. Um, and then last year, we went and got one because. Basically, you're supposed to before you go into a place where there's elderly people or small children because their immune systems are not as strong. They're either either because they're very old or because they're very young, okay? or they're you know, or you go somewhere where people are immune suppressed, right? If they're uh, getting cancer treatments or something like that, their immune system gets very suppressed and, and they can't fight off infections. So you need to have your flu vaccination for that. So we even got our flu shots last year because of that because we didn't want to get elderly people in the home infected because their immune systems are down. Right? Um, and then, oddly enough, I didn't get sick at all last year. I was like, oh, sweet, I haven't gotten sick all year. It's like two weeks till the flu back then, I guess. Okay. Uh, uh, but yeah, that's, it. that's why we have to, that's why you want to do that. Okay, vaccinations are good uh, in that way. Okay, uh, so the key points for today, we want to know the points of the cell theory. Okay, we talked about the atomic theory before. Okay, now we're going to talk about the cell theory, uh, how they relate to living organisms. Okay, we're going to know who contributed to the development of the cell theory. Thankfully, it's not as many people as contributed to the atomic one. Okay, and we need to recognize the implication between, or the implication of, similarities between plant and animal cells. You put a plant cell and an animal cell side by side, there are some obviously noticeable differences, but there are way more similarities between how an animal cell and a plant cell work than there are differences. Okay, and we have to look at what that means from an evolutionary perspective. Okay. All right. Okay. Point number one of the cell theory has to do with what we just talked about. All organisms are made up of cells, just like the first point of the atomic theory is all thing, all matter is made of atoms. All organisms are made up of cells. Some are unicellular, which is one cell, like paramecium, okay, or um, these um, silicates here, okay, um, or a multicellular organism like a cactus. Okay, so point number one of the cell theory, all organisms are made up of cells. Okay, the second point has to do with um, what cells do. Okay, so cells are basically what we're made up of. And all the time, cells are carrying out the functions needed by our body. Okay? Now, we're a multicellular organism, which means that we have cells that are specialized. Okay? We have all different kinds of cells. If you're a single-celled organism, you don't have specialization. You have one cell that does everything. Okay? But all cells are essentially capable of doing all jobs. They're just specialized to do this job. Okay? So muscle cells, for example, 
okay, are very specialized in that they have lots of fibers running through them that can contract and, and relax. They, they have more than one nucleus because muscle cells often rupture and break and then they, they go back together again. Having more than one nucleus allows that process to happen more quickly. They have lots of mitochondria which burn sugar for energy because muscle cells demand lots of energy. Now, if you're looking at the cell on the inside of your small intestine, it's going to look a lot different, okay? Its cell membrane is going to be structured differently. It's going to have a lot less fiber in it. It's going to have, um, you know, more things to do with detoxification and stuff like that because it's constantly absorbing and processing materials. It has a very different job than muscle cell does, okay? So if you're looking at two different cells from the human body, they may look very different because they are specialized in different jobs. So. Point number two is that the cell carries out the basic functions of an organism. And that point is probably the most important one. We'll come back to that point of the cell theory time and time again in this unit as we start dealing with what cells do, what organisms do, why do organisms have this, this type of cell and that type of cell, because that's one of the basic functions. Okay, the uh, plant has to have these cells in it because it helps conserve water and that's a basic function. This uh, you know, this part of the plant has these kind of cells. They're carrying out this basic function. Okay, and point number three has to do with how cells reproduce. Okay, cells are not created. There's no factory in your body pumping out new cells. Okay, all cells come from the division of already existing cells. Right, yes, you do have some cells in your body that are designed to reproduce and produce more cells more quickly. They're called stem cells. Okay, you may have heard that term before. Okay, um, you have what are called in your body pluripotent stem cells. You find them in bone marrow and, and places like that. Okay, um, so they're they're important for making a, for the making of new types of cells. Um, but all cells reproduce by this process. It's called binary fission. They split in half. Okay. Before a cell can split in half, it needs to make sure that it makes copies of everything inside so that there's enough for both, especially the genetic material. Okay? Most of a cell's division process has to do with making sure that the DNA is equally split so that both cells get copies of all of the DNA that's necessary. If that doesn't happen, one of the cells will likely die. Okay? If it happens early on or that process has happened in the formation of a gamete, that would be an egg or a sperm, okay, then the offspring produced by the union of one of those cells may have some very serious genetic problems. Okay? For example, Down syndrome. Okay? Everybody know somebody with Down syndrome? Okay? Right? Okay. Down syndrome is caused by a person having instead of two copies of chromosome 21, they have three. Okay? And that happens because in the division that formed either the egg or the sperm, one of both of the copies of chromosome 21 ended up staying in the cell instead of going into the other. Okay? And so as a result, okay, this gamete, when it met the other cell, and they produced that first cell that produces you, okay, or that person, um, that it had more than it was more genetic material than it was supposed to. And that causes a lot of developmental problems. Okay, having that extra genetic material. The cell gets confused in where it's supposed to look for information, and that leads to the symptoms that we see for a person who has Down syndrome. If one of the cells has both of those ones, is there a cell that doesn't have any of them? Yes, and that would likely result in a non-fertilization event. Or some trisomies and some lack of genetic material just result in a miscarriage, essentially. Right? So sometimes the, the baby will develop to a certain point, and then that genetic problem becomes fatal. Um, and sometimes that doesn't happen until the child's born. Sometimes you'll carry a child with a genetic abnormality full term, and then after, shortly thereafter, they only live for a few hours. There's a few, uh, a few of those trisomy 13, I believe it is, um, because they actually thought my first son had that. They, they thought that he had this, this problem. Um, and, uh, and they thought, you know, they, the fact they told us should not carry through because he's going to have him and he's going to die. Uh, they were wrong. Thankfully. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's you know, that those kind of things happen, but it can be pretty serious depending on which trisomy. I mean, a person with Down syndrome is going to live a full life, 
Um, but obviously, they have some pretty major developmental challenges as a result of that. So the, the copying and the sorting of the DNA is the most important process in the cell division and in the cell reproduction. If it doesn't happen correctly, it's likely that both cells could die. Having too much is not good, and having too little is obviously not good. Okay, because your DNA is the instructions for running you. Okay, if I had a magic cloning machine, I'd only need one cell from your body. Okay, I can take the DNA in that cell and it could tell me exactly how to make you. Okay, that's I mean that's that's the whole idea behind it. Okay. Okay. In fact, that's how they made Golly, that first clone. Dolly. That's the sheesh, right? The sheep. Okay. They basically took they took DNA from from a cell and they placed it in the egg and in the sperm, and they essentially made this thing that was an exact copy of an already living sheep because they they didn't allow they took the DNA from that sheep and didn't allow basically anything else to change it, and they just made it a copy of itself. Okay. okay. But you know, Dolly actually had a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah. She like it, uh, she developed arthritis very early on. Um, had some some other health issues around. Yeah. They did a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. She was a clone. Yeah. Yeah. She was a clone. She was a clone. She was a clone. Okay. So, development of the cell theory. Yeah. There's only three points to the cell theory. That's it. Okay. So three points to the cell theory. Every, all living organisms are made of cells. Okay, cells carry out the basic functions of the organism, most important of the three points. Okay, and cells are not created, they come from the division of existing cells. Okay, development of the cell theory. First person, physicist. Ooh, physics rocks. We discover everything important and then we hand it off to the other people. Okay, so Hook, 1665. Hook was doing an experiment on paired lenses because he was a physicist. Okay. So his, he developed the first microscope purely as a physics experiment. He wanted to see what the effect of putting multiple lenses in a row would have and see if he could use that to change the path of light. Okay? And it did. And it magnified things and made them bigger. Okay? So um, he made a microscope that kind of looked like this. Okay? It's kind of the basic form of a modern microscope. Um, and it had like a small lens and it had the eyepiece up here. Okay? And essentially what happens in a microscope is you have light. So here's our specimen. And you have light coming off of the specimen in straight parallel lines called rays. Okay, light rays. Okay? So they hit the lens. That's not a very good lens, but you get the idea. Okay? And what happens is because the lens is made of glass and it's curved, Okay? It changes the speed and thus the direction of the light going through it. Okay? So what happens is the light actually does this. Okay? The rays kind of cross each other. Okay? And when they cross, they diverge. Which means instead of seeing the specimen this big, now I see it bigger. But it's also... It's plus flipped. flipped. Right. It's what we call a real image. Okay. So the path of light is altered as it goes through the lens. Okay. And that's how we make the object bigger. Okay. The same is true if you're using like a reflecting telescope. Okay. You have a curved mirror. The light rays come in from a distant object. They hit that reflecting mirror. They're converged and then diverged. Okay. Um, and then you see it bigger through the eyepiece. Right. Everyone kind of follow there. That was Hooke's design. Okay. He, used the, he made the first microscope, and in order to test it, what he did is he took a cork, a piece of cork from a, like a wine bottle, and he just sliced it really thin, and he set it underneath. Now, what's cork come from? A tree. Now, the dead part of the tree, okay, but from the trunk, the wood of the tree. Okay, but this is what he saw. This is what he drew okay, as what he saw underneath the microscope. He actually saw dead, dead plant cells. Okay, which is why he named them cells. They looked empty to him. Okay? First off, his microscope didn't magnify very much. Okay? It was only 30 times. Okay? And they looked empty. They looked like rooms in a prison. Cells. They had walls on all four sides. And so he said, oh, I'm going to call these things cells. Here, biology. Okay? I just gave you the most important tool you'll ever have. Physics says you're welcome. Okay? Yeah. All right, so Hook discovers cells. Okay, first part of the development of the cell theory. Hook discovers cells in court. It's a little bit off topic, but do you? No, it's like not off topic. Like, what do you think the elements? 
Cells yes, cells are going to be made of mostly molecular things, yeah, fats and proteins and sugar. And oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, so after Hook, okay, the, the microscope goes through some evolution. Okay, People are trying to make a better microscope. Um, this is one of the microscopes that was developed. Luckily, it didn't catch on because it would have been really, really hard to use. But it did magnify things fairly well because it would actually project them, okay? Um, you wouldn't actually like hold it like this and kind of close one eye and look through it. You'd actually like project it on a screen, okay? Um, so you'd have your specimen on the tip of this thing here. You'd have your lens here, and then the light would go through the specimen and then through the lens and be diverged. And the further away you could make the screen, the bigger you could make the object. The problem was that you needed to have a really, really bright light source in order for that to work. And it wasn't really good, okay? It was a hard microscope to use. You had to, you had to hold it, and then you had to look over there. You, had, you know, like it was kind of a pain in the neck. Um, but Anton von Leeuwenhoek studied organisms that he, that he saw on his microscope, okay? Uh, so he looked in pond water. He would have seen things like amoebas and paramecia and giardia and whatever, okay? Uh, he looked at blood cells and prick his finger and looked at the blood. I don't know how he got sperm cells from cattle, because well, cattle are girls. Bulls are boys, but and I don't know how he got the sperm from them. I'm gonna throw my hands up on that one and go, "You're brave." Good for you. Okay. Um, okay. And he had his microscope was able to count was able to magnify 300 times. Okay. So he would have seen a fair amount of detail in cells. So while Hook discovered cells, he never saw what cells did because to him cells were empty little boobs. Okay. But what Leeuwen Hook saw was Cells are alive, and cells are in a lot of things. Okay, lots of things are made of cells, and cells are are dynamic and changing and mobile, and they can do lots of stuff. Okay, so important discoveries in terms of living organisms. Leeuwenhoek was the first person to use a microscope to see living cells. Okay, so that's kind of what he did. All right, and then after Leeuwenhoek, two Swedish scientists named Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, they developed a hypothesis that went something like this. If cells are the basic unit of all life, and organisms from all groups of living, or living things are viewed under a microscope, then cells will be found in all of them. They spent years proving that hypothesis. Okay? They looked at specimens from animals, they looked at specimens from plants, they looked at bacteria, okay? they looked at fungus, right? they looked at the microorganisms in pond water, all of that kind of stuff, and they found that yes, actually every organism they looked at under their microscope contained cells. And they were able to accept their hypothesis, and it actually became so well accepted that it became the cell theory. Okay, that all organisms are made up of cells. That's how science works, by the way. If you ever hear somebody say this, well, that's just a theory. Okay, No, a theory becomes a theory when it's proven time and time again. Theories become laws. Okay, Theory and a law are really not that far apart. Okay? So if somebody says, well, that's just a theory, uh, well, a theory is backed by years and years of proof. Okay? Now, a hypothesis, that's different. Okay? You can say, well, that's just a hypothesis. You're right. A hypothesis could be right or wrong. A theory is beyond really the point of being right or wrong anymore. A theory is accepted and taught. Okay? All right. Um, so, Sliden and Swan, they developed the, the original cell theory. All organisms are made of cells, and the cells carry out the basic functions of the organism, and they watch the cells divide. Okay? They would have seen that cells reproduce by only this fashion. Okay, now, of course, Schleiden and, Schleiden and Swan, uh, 1839, they didn't have, they didn't know about micros, or didn't know about um, viruses, okay? Those weren't discovered until the advent of the electron microscope, which came much later, okay? Their stuff could magnify up to 600 times, which for that time was pretty good, okay? Our microscopes in the lab will magnify 400, okay? If you get an oil immersion lens, you can go up to 600, but they're hard to use, okay? So we don't have them on our side. All right, so that's development of the cell theory. So our ability to examine cells has allowed us to find relationships between organisms. Okay? If we look at the cells 
uh, you know, uh, let's say like a fish, a chicken, and a dog, a person, we're going to find that their muscle cells all look very similar. Their gut cells all look very similar. Their heart cells all look very similar because we evolved from a common ancestor. Okay? But the same is also true for plants and animals. Plants and animals have cells that carry out similar processes. And that's not by accident. It's not like they coincidentally evolved exactly the same process. It's far more likely that they came from a common ancestor. And micropaleontology is in fact proving that. Okay? There's a whole science around micropaleontology, looking at microscopic fossils, fossils of bacteria that are billions of years old. Okay? And seeing what did these cells do and what kind of structures did they have? What, what kind of processes did they carry out? And we're finding that a lot of those same processes are still present in cells today. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, got animal cell here on the left, plant cell here on the right. Okay, now there's obvious differences in that the plant cell has a big yellowish orange cell wall. Okay, the animal cell doesn't have a cell wall, but I mean, other than that, there's a lot of things similar, right? They both have these purple structures called nuclei. Okay, they both have these blue structures called endoplasmic reticulum. They both have these orange structures that are mitochondria. Okay, they both have a cell membrane. Okay, they both have a Golgi apparatus. They both have cytoplasm. They've got a lot of similar structures, more than they have different. Okay, and it's not just the structures; it's also the processes. Okay, yes, sure, a, a plant carries out photosynthesis. That's how it makes its sugar. But plants and animals metabolize their sugar in exactly the same way. They use exactly the same process to burn sugar. It's called cellular respiration. Okay? So many processes are identical between plants and animals, and it can't be because they coincidentally evolved them separately, but that they came from a common ancestor that also had those processes. How does like the animal cell the you know what? Every cell diagram you get, for some reason, has a flagella on it, even though very few cells have a flagella. Okay? Like, if, if, you're, if you're female, you don't have any flagellated cells. Okay? If you're male, you have sperm. They have a flagella. But, yeah, so few cells actually have a flagella. I don't know why it's on every diagram. Yeah, it's always on there. Okay? Uh, so, lots and lots of similarities. Okay? That's kind of an important thing for us to understand. Okay? Um, that that means, or that's what we've taken to mean, that it comes from a common ancestor. Now, I know that you might be thinking, well, Mr. Curry, you're teaching something that they told me was different in religion, but I'm going to cover that actually a little bit later on in the unit. Okay? How uh, yeah, people and science are actually not at all at odds on that whole evolution thing. Okay? As much as people thought for lots and lots of time, not true at all. Okay? Uh, Pope Francis is actually Kevin. Okay? That was his that was his original uh, line of work because he was in chemistry. Uh, so he's a scientist and he has actually come forward and said, no, the Catholic Church believes in the idea of evolution, the idea of natural selection. The church is not at all opposed to those ideas. Okay? And I'll explain that to you in another lesson. Okay? Uh, but yeah, we'll have that day where we talk about that. Um, <laughs>